So why a universal flood? Why, why and, and for those of you who sat through it in Sunday school for many, many years, uh, just uh, endure with us for the next five or so minutes, but why a universal flood? It's very few professions, uh, and the one of the ones that come, come to mind is that of a painter. A painter is one of the very few professions that can start off with a blank canvas and start off with an idea. And that painter can paint, and, and that de design, he has the ability, he or she has the ability to watch that painting come from inception to completion. Sometimes in that process, that painter can see that idea not kind of panning out the way that he thought. Uh, but, but in that profession, that painter has the unique ability to be able to wipe the canvas clean, to be able to start over. That's kind of where, where, what happened with the reason behind the universal flood, some of the causes. There were, there were events that led up to it that made God basically have to wipe the canvas clean. One of them is in Genesis 6-5, uh, as, as we see some of the call causes. In Genesis 6-5, and we, and we note the wickedness of mankind, the wickedness of man, mankind. Mankind was following every desire of their heart, that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. They were following every desire of their heart, whatever they wanted to do. 11 o'clock service, we'll call it YOLO. I don't know what, what we would uh, say uh, in the 8th, 8th, 3rd service. They were just doing whatever they felt. Whatever they felt felt was good. Whatever, they, whatever desire came to their heart, that's what was going on. Uh, the writer go, goes on in, in Genesis 6, 11, and 12, and he says, Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. Everything, I mean, it was chaos. Everything had gone bad. That original plan that started off in the Garden, Garden of Eden, because of sin, it had just gone completely bad. I love the way the Message Bible says it. Uh, we have to be careful with the uh, paraphrase by Bibles because they really just kind of take God's word and kind of just put it into terms that, uh, well, here's what I think he's saying. So I wouldn't use it for anything other than just to probably highlight. But I love the language that it uses. It says in the Message Bible, as far as God was concerned, the earth had become a sewer. There was violence everywhere. God looked, God took one look and saw how bad it was. Everyone corrupt and corrupting. Life was corrupt to the core. God said to Noah, it's all over. It's the end of the human race. The violence is everywhere. I'm making a clean sweep. Both of those capture what was going on that led up to the universal flood. And it also, it grieved the heart of God. Uh, in Bible study, we had a, a great question, and it's a question that a lot of Christians have uh, b between what, what does it mean to grieve the whole, whole, whole Holy Spirit and quench the Holy Spirit. Well, the Bible gives you several indicators of what, what that means. One of them is right here. When God looked upon the earth, the scriptures say it grieved his heart. In Genesis 5 through 6, it says, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of his heart and evil was continual. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth and he was grieved in his heart. The complete disobedience, just, just outright disobedience to God's word grieved his heart. That's what grieves God's heart. This, this, was, <laughs> this was overwhelming, so it provoked a response in God. It provoked a response in him. It's not that God changed, changed his mind. We want to be very, very careful with that because most of us, how many of y'all have changed your mind about something? You started on something, you changed your mind and went a new course. A lot of us. Well, that implies, and we, we know that that means that we're not perfect. Well, God is. It's not that God changed, changed his mind. It's just that God responds to man one way when he's obedient, and he responds to man another way when he is disobedient. But this is how this is how the inception of the flood came, and, and it's critical for us to understand this piece of, of of how how it came about, and it came about just because of a rampant wickedness upon the earth, and it started within the Garden of Eden. Because even to this day, the offer of having the godlike ability to be able to discern between good and evil is something that a lot of us think that that would be great. We read about it in the story of Genesis when 
Adam and Eve were tempted with it, and we kind of, well, I wouldn't have did it, but the offer to have God-like ability to be able to discern between good and evil. I mean, you hear it today, and it's like, well, if I knew all the options, if I knew the goods and the bads, then I could make an informed decision. The problem with having the, the, the knowledge of good and evil that Adam and Eve didn't know was that we can't resist evil. We can know good, but we can't resist evil. We cannot resist it. We have no, no resistance for it. Paul says, says it throughout his text, he said, I do the things that I did not want to do. We cannot resist evil. So once Adam and Eve ate of that apple and they were given the ability to know both good and evil, if you can't resist evil and you know good, what are you only going to do in your heart? Evil. The earth was rampant with it. Sin had overtaken the earth. And God had to make a decision. So the main thing of why the flood in your hand handout, because God is intolerant to sin. God is intolerant to sin. And I think more so you know that uh, you, you can see throughout the text that, that, that God is completely intolerant to sin. Now then, as God progressively revealed himself throughout the text, uh, we see that God, then he used a flood. But for us, we have the same inability to cope with sin. That's why we have who? Jesus Christ. We have a helper. We have his son, Jesus Christ, and we have the Holy Spirit. In Hebrews, and you may just want to mark this in your notes or on a page in your Bible, in Hebrews 13, 6, the Bible says, so that we confidently say, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What will man do to me? God knew that we needed, we need a helper. We have to have someone in our corner to help us to fight those urges of our hearts. In John 14, 24, he goes on to say, then by Christ himself, oh, I'm sorry, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all that I say to you. We need a helper. The reason for the universal flood was because of God's intolerance to sin. It was because God's intolerance to sin. For then he wiped the earth clean with water and made a promise for one family and animals that he was saved. But it was primarily because, and that's, that's kind of what I want to drive home, it was primarily because of the overwhelming sin on, on the earth and God's intolerance to sin. But for us, the application that we can get out of this is that we have two things. We have Jesus Christ that we can cast our sins upon. And we also have the whole, whole Holy Spirit who is with us every single day. We could turn this into a Bible study because you really have to kind of uh, understand kind of the dispensation and that, that the Holy Spirit didn't individually endow every person at that time. The Holy Spirit was present, absolutely. But he didn't individually endow every person during the time of Genesis. You don't recognize the power of the Holy Spirit until you realize when he's not individually with you every single day of how out of control you would be. We think about now, when things are out of control, <laughs> imagine if the Holy Spirit wasn't with you every single day. Imagine if every single thought that you had, you never thought, I probably shouldn't do that. You would be, you would un understand the con, con, context. But next, so the results of the universal flood. There are basically three results that the text reveals. The way that we understand this is another interesting trait. If you want to know about a book in the Bible, a passage in the Bible, one of the core things that you want to do is to try to find out who was that book written to originally. Who was that originally written to? Who was, when, when the Holy Spirit inspired Moses to sit down and start writing, who was the audience? Well, the audience of this book were the Hebrew slaves that were in captivity in Egypt. So basically the children of God. Once you un un understand that, we can see that there are three critical things that jump out. Uh, and I captured them in your handout, I believe. They would have understood that, that the righteous judgment of God and his intolerance for sin within the universal destruction of the flood was equally as important as God's unfailing faithfulness. They would have understood that 
the righteous judgment that God passed on the earth and his intolerance to sin was equally as important as his unfailing faithfulness, demonstrated by the promise of protection for Noah and his family from Genesis 6, 18, and 22. Even during the catastrophic destruction of the flood, raining for 40 days and 40 nights and water from the oceans cracking open and the earth completely covered. I mean, it's mountaintops right now that we, we have. I think the highest in altitude is about 8,600 meters high, completely covered to the top of water. Even within this cataclysmic destruction, they can see the faithfulness. They, those readers, those original hearers of, of the word would have seen God's faithfulness. For the Hebrew slaves to understand that the very same God who promised to Noah that he would protect his family in that massive destruction was the very same God that had told them, I will set you free. That would have spoke volumes. And that is when we read the text and we see what God has done. We see what God has done in the past. We see what he's historically done in circumstances that may sometimes outweigh ours. And we see that God has been faithful throughout. Look at Genesis 6, uh, 18 through 22. And basically, I'll just read 18 and 22 because it captures the essence of the promise. He says, but I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your son's wives with you. And in verse 22, it says, thus Noah did according to all that God had commanded him, so he did. Noah was obedient. Noah was obedient because he knew that God is faithful also. Likewise with us. Now, if you put your name in the parentheses, we can continue on with your handout now. Or someone's name you're praying, praying for. Uh, I made five parentheses. I got three kids and two grand, grand, grand kids. That's probably the reason I put five. But it's, it's, you, when you read the text, you want to personalize the text. When the Holy Spirit sat down, when these authors sat down and were guided by the Holy Spirit, these were personal letters, personal books, personal memoirs that they wrote to a specific audience. Personalize the text. So in your text, in your handout, and I'll just read my name into mine, it says, likewise, William, you have that same promise from the same God, the same God who promised to take care of Noah and did even though he wiped out the earth and Noah was probably the only person who could say something that most of us have said. I know I, I have said it to my mama. Everybody's doing it, mama. Noah was the, probably the one person on earth at that time who could have said, everybody is messing up. Everybody except for one family. But that very same promise that God made, William, he makes that same promise to you. Look at 2 Peter 1, 4. For by these he has granted to William his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world, uh, in the world by lust. Paul's response, I love Paul's response to the way uh, some, and I hear this a lot in the profession that I was in and the profession I'm in now. Paul was responding to those who had said, well, Christians are just, are just sheep to a slaughter. They're just weak. Paul responds in Romans chapter 8, verses 37 through 39. In the original text, that no is like an emphatic no. He says, no, in all things, William is more than a conqueror through him who loves us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor death, nor anything else in all of creation, will be able to separate William from the love of God in Christ our Lord Jesus. When you personalize the text, the way the text was personalized to those original folks who received it, you, not to spiritualize it, but you feel the power of God in it. You feel God speaking to you, speaking to his children, speaking to each individual person. Paul rattled off a list of things for us 
it doesn't matter the bills, it doesn't, doesn't matter the stress, the stress of trying to find a job, the stress of staying in a job. It does, doesn't matter the church programs or the guidance of which way the finances are going to undergo, where are they going to come from, where are we going to eat, where are we going to clothe, what's going to happen next week. It does not matter because no one will be able to separate William from the love of God in Christ. No one would be able to separate New Life Bible Church from the love of God. No one would be able to separate Minister Edwards from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. No one. And we see this within the calamity of the flood. Worldwide destruction. Everything's wiped out. Everything is gone. An impossible circumstance. It's rained for 40 days and 40 nights in other places. Scientists and other smart folks love to hide, hide like this. It's rained for 45 days nonstop. Well, all you got to do is just do a little bit of a search and a little bit of, a, as our pastor is always saying, put a little bit of common sense into things. You start to look at words. What do words mean? What does nonstop mean? Well, in the weather world, nonstop means that in a 24-hour period, if it rains once, and it rained once, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, well, it's rained nonstop. Well, see, that's not what God said. <laughs> God said it rained nonstop, and the, and the text doesn't give any indicators that the rain ever stopped. But nothing can separate us from God. And the result, the result of the universal flood was used to show God's judgment, his intolerance to sin, and best of all, his unfailing faithfulness to care for his children in the midst of, of calamity, in the midst of drama. In the midst of debt, in the midst of death, in the midst of anything, God will take care of you. He's proven it time and time again. So what assurances do we get from the universal flood? What message, again, the first thing I like to do is try to capture what did Moses intend to write to the slaves in Egypt? Because that's who the letter, that's who Genesis was, was scripted for. It was scripted for them. The Holy Spirit set Moses down to write this, tell them what I've done, show them what, what, I've, what I have done. And the keeping of the Hebrew children at this time, this would have been the only children of God. During this time, here are the children of God. And guess what? We're doing the same thing. We're using God's word to show you what God can do. So, can do. so the assurances of the universal flood. The first one, I think I have them listed out in your handout. Uh, the first, first, first one that, that showed that God is the creator and the controller of the universe. It shows that no, no one else. We have put the best minds on the planet in just trying to control one storm. We, we, we can't do it. We, we can't do it. We can make it rain sometimes with enough things and it might get moist and we'll claim victory. But it showed that God was the creator and controller of the universe. It showed God to be sovereign. It showed also that he is intolerant to sin. The universal flood showed that he is intolerant to sin. He's not going to turn a blind eye to sin. It showed that he is faithful to those who are obedient to his word. It showed that he is faithful to those who are obedient to his word. And fourth, it shows that he will protect slash rescue his children no matter the situation. That's critical. That's critical for me. It may not be critical for you. you. Some may be floating in an atmosphere of just perfection. Everything's going great. Kids are going great. Jobs is going great. Just nothing's wrong. Uh, it, and not that you got to be now, but I don't want to flip the script all the way over to we have to be the Christians. It's downtrodden and everything is terribly wrong and we're just waiting for the glory of God. To, but things do go wrong in our lives. Things do go a little bit off balance in our lives. So that part about no matter the situation, no matter the situation is critical. The world had to been in utter and complete chaos for God to say that the only people worth saving were Noah and his family. But Noah trusted God. He trusted God. He had faith in God when every single person on the planet did not. Every single person on the planet. So if you were at a job, if you were at a business, if you were in a house, if you were in a relationship, if you were in a family where you're the only person 
you're the only person that wants to stand firm on your faith, do so. Do so. Do so with confidence in knowing that God first is a living God. God recognizes you. God will care for, for you. And think back to what Noah must have thought. I'm the, I'm the only person who is doing this. Attendance can be low, and it can f- freak us out. I walked in this morning, and it was me and Brother Jordan. I got kind of nervous. Instantly, I got kind of nervous. Brother Jordan said, well, I'm, well I'm, I'm here. And I gave him the Christian response, you know, two or more. And I was thinking, man, I hope two or more show up. <laughs> it bothers us. It bothers us when we, when, when we think we're the only ones. But take heart in knowing that God recognizes that. God recognizes it. It's all also, as we close down, that we don't even, we don't even need, and don't take, take this the wrong way, we don't even need that much faith. <laughs> it's, I don't want to undo all that you have in your mind doing, but you, you, don't, you, you look at the calamity that must have been going on at that point in time, and the very limited acts of God, we have volumes of what God has done. What did Noah have? Nothing. Written, nothing. Not a thing, nothing. And nothing written. <laughs> we forget about him, sort of. That he didn't have all these great stories of prophets in the past and all this great sermon material. He had nothing. Nothing but standalone faith. God said he was going to do it, and he knew about Adam and Eve, and, and he just trusted him. He had, had, had faith. We have volumes of proof. We have family members and pastors and ministers and cousins and uncles and aunties. We just need a little bit of faith, a mustard seed kind of faith. When you begin to understand the text, you begin to understand the references that the text make, that you only need the faith of a mustard seed. That, that's kind of why Jesus would get a little frustrated at times. He was like, you of little faith. I mean, look at, look at how much has been proven and said and done. Come on. A small amount of faith. Nor trusted God. He had faith in God when everybody did not. We have a promise from God also. We have a promise from his son. We have help from his Holy Spirit. And the promise which says in Deuteronomy 31, 6, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or tremble at them. For the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. He will not fail nor forsake you. Be strong. Be courageous. Don't be afraid and do not tremble in the face of adversity, pain, and conflict because our God has assured us time and time again that he will take care of us as long as we are obedient to his word. Amen.